Let's just uh, thank the Lord for who he is and what he's done for us. Let's do that together. Father, how blessed we are to have known you, to, uh, to be loved by you, to be given the opportunity to choose you and receive life forevermore. Father, you are a mighty God, mighty to save. Thank you, Lord, for the, the witness of your church, and I thank you for the soul that was saved this week because of the witness of your people. Father, we just uh, we love you for what that, that you're always at work and that you would do a, a great work in us. Now, Father, we're here on a Sunday afternoon because we love you. So receive our worship. Receive uh, our offerings, our prayers, our praises, our songs unto you. And Lord, um, take this message and I pray, Lord, that you'll do with it exactly what you planned. This Nothing today surprised you, surprised us, but not you. You're the Almighty God. So uh, meet with us now. And sir, we'll give you all the praise. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you have your Bible, turn to John chapter number 3. Um, I am not preaching the sermon that I was going to preach. Uh, we're going through our five um, core values, our high five, and uh, we talked about worship, we talked about fellowship, we talked about evangelism, and today um, we are going to talk about discipleship. Uh, actually, uh, I'm not going to share the one that I was going to share. I will share it next Sunday. We'll talk about uh, that particular sermon. I look around and I'm uh, I'm blessed that y'all came, really am. But I didn't know exactly who was going to come last night or yesterday. Um, didn't really know uh, what was going to happen. We started getting uh, calls sometime about two um, if we were going to have church today and all that. And uh, my crystal ball was froze over. I couldn't tell what was going to happen today. So. Um, I was just like you. I just didn't know. So I, I looked at the weather, and they, um, they said that it was going to get down to about 27 where I am. We had about 80 inches where I am. I stuck my measuring tape down in it just to see. Um, it was, um, but this morning at 11.15, it was still 31 degrees, and I thought, well, maybe we did the right thing. The one thing that I was worried about was the parking lot. Spoke with Broadish yesterday, and um, his crystal ball was froze up too, so we didn't know. But um, I told him, I said, I really don't want a demolition derby in the parking lot. Amen? I mean, and I don't want y'all bumping on each other and falling on frozen steps. Virgil does enough for all of us. Amen? We just pray for Virgil. I asked him if they took away his license. He said his wife did. So. <laughs> I think there's a limit on your insurance company in one year, brother. But, um, so uh, it was Mark's idea to, to come at three. And I thought that was an out. I, I had told him, I said, I didn't even think about that. Didn't even. We talked about just doing service tonight. But if we did service tonight, and you, this was yesterday, we didn't know if it would be dark. and or We knew it would be dark. But um, <laughs> we, we didn't know if it would be iced over and all of that. So, um, so we decided to do it in the afternoon. And it's, uh, it, it's, it's great. It's wonderful. Um, so uh, let's look at, this is something that there's, when you talk about discipleship and, and the great commission that we are to go forward and make disciples, can I, can I say that that's not a, a kind of a good thing? It's not the good commission. It's the great commission. And it's the, it's the life of the church. It's the privilege. It's an, it's, last week when I said that evangelism comes from the overflow, so does discipleship. Because discipleship must be, should be, has to be daily. Daily. So um, if, if we're going to double up on any one, discipleship would be a good thing. So I'm not going to ask you to stand in reading God's Word because we're going to cover 21 verses in John 3, and uh, you may never have heard a sermon on discipleship from John chapter 3. That's okay. I haven't either. But hopefully both of us will in about 30 minutes. 
Let's see what it is that God had to say. Verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, that is to say teacher, we know that you are a teacher come from God and no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. That was a great statement. It was a statement of belief. He says, we know that the hand of God is upon you. Jesus answered and said to him, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. Jesus went straight. He didn't do any beating around the bush. He came straight to the heart of the matter. Now let's listen here. You've heard this so many times. He said, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He will not know the things of God because they're spiritually understood. So in verse 4, Nicodemus says, well, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? His mind is still back on the physical. I'm an adult. How can I be born again? How, how do you go back into your mom's womb? Sometimes people can't see because all they can, uh, their understanding is so small and they're, they're not willing to be stretched beyond their own understanding that they have at that particular point in time. So Jesus said in verse 5, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now in verse 3, he said, unless you're born again, you will not be able to see it. But now he's talking about participation in it. You need some spiritual eyes to, to see it. But really, you're going to have to step out on faith because this is a spiritual thing. So you must be born of water and spirit, spirit, so that you can enter in. Verse 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. It must have been a, a windy night that night when he was speaking with Nicodemus because in verse 8 he says, the wind blows where it wishes. You hear the sound of it, but you cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. And you probably just almost feel the wind on your cheek as, you could, as they're sitting there talking. He said, you can't see it. You don't know where it's coming from. You don't know where it's going because it's not visible. But he says, so is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Though you don't see the Spirit, you don't know where it's coming from, you still know it to be true. You cannot see the wind, but you can, see the, you can, you can feel the effects of the wind. You cannot see the Spirit, but you can see the effects of the Spirit. Verse 9, Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, and by the way, verse 10, I don't think he's being condescending here. I think he has great respect for Nicodemus because Nicodemus was a, a ruler in Judaism, but he could not see beyond his religion. So many people do not come to God today because all they can see is, is the picture of God that they see in us. And if all they see in us is religion, then they can't get beyond that to see the truth of the, of the workings of God in our heart. So he said, are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things? Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen. You do not receive our witness. I've been doing these things in front of you and you, you haven't gotten it yet. If I had told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is, the Son of Man who is in heaven. Verse 14, key verse. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man be lifted. Even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Numbers 21, verse 4 through 9. The children of Israel were griping and complaining. And once again, they were pining back for the days of, of slavery in Egypt. We, they were tired of this worthless bread, the manner of heaven. They called it worthless bread that they had been eating, the provision of God for them. So God allowed serpents to go in their midst and bit some, not all, but some. So he 
got Moses to build a fiery serpent, a bronze serpent, put it on a pole, and those who would look, not all, but those who would look to that bronze serpent as it was lifted up were healed. And I, I have a feeling that not only did they receive help, but I believe there was a work of God in their heart and their life too. I, at least I would hope so. So he says, in the same way as Moses had to lift up the bronze serpent so that some could, could believe and look up and be healed, he said, in the same way, the Son of Man must be lifted up. And, and Nicodemus knew exactly what he was talking about, crucifixion. Even so, the Son of Man must be lifted up so those who look to him can be healed. Look what it says in verse 15. And by the way, I'm going to read verse 15, 16, and 17 together because how many of y'all have memorized John 3, 16? Most memorized verse out there, very first verse that I memorized. Maybe the second. I think Jesus wept, got me through Sunday school when I was a little kid when you had to memorize a verse. But, but John 3.16 is so very well known. And praise God for John 3.16. But it should never be quoted without verse 17 as well. Look in verse 15. Whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Speaking of the one that will be lifted up. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already. Praise God that we understand that Jesus would be lifted up for us. Praise God that the love that God had for you and I made it to where he would send his son, his only son, the words that have come so close to our heart, his only begotten son, so that we would not have to perish but have everlasting life because the plan of God was not to come and condemn the world, but that through Christ the world could be saved. God did not, and his sovereign understanding, want to condemn God wanted to rescue. God wanted to pay the ransom. God wanted the relationship that would come as we would give our heart and life unto him and begin that relationship of being a child of God that would begin at salvation but would continue throughout all of time, throughout all of eternity. The word condemnation obviously means to condemn, but it meant something very special to the Jews and the people of that day. It really meant a tribunal. A tribunal of seven. They were very well known. If there was a, a, a charge that was to be brought against someone, there would be seven people that would be there that the charge would be uh, brought to them, all the evidence, all the all the ability to give an, a, a, of a de defense, and those seven would say whether that person was guilty or whether that person was in it, innocent. The tribunal, the, this condemnation that so many people saw that, that you had to be something so that God would not judge you and find you unrighteous, unworthy, and condemned. He makes it very place. He said, I didn't come to judge you and to, to send you away. I came, Jesus came, he, he, my only begotten, so that you could not be condemned, but receive. Receive. One of my favorite verses in all of the Word of God is Romans 8, 1. There is therefore... No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That was so good, let me do it again. There is therefore, say it with me, no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh, but according 
to the Spirit. That word walk means a way of life. God spoke, or excuse me, Paul spoke much about our walk. Look what it says in verse number 18. I'm going to get a run and start with verse 18, but I'm headed to verse 19. He who believes in him, that is Christ, is not condemned. But he who does not believe is condemned already. We were born in sin. We came to an age and time that we knew that, that sin was wrong, and we chose to sin anyway. Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that, that the light has come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. This is the judgment. This is the condemnation, that men love darkness. Now, church, you, you're getting used to me a little bit, and you know how many times I talk about the word love, and it's very important. Agape, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Please understand that that word means to see value in something. And because you see value in it, you cherish it. You hold it close. You never desire to turn loose from it again. As a matter of fact, you'll turn loose of everything else because you have a, a value in that, that that is greater than all. You put it above you. You willingly put yourself underneath it, and it pulls you toward it. Nothing else matters because you cherish it. You cherish it. Now that's easy for us to understand of God's love for us. By the way, it is supposed to be our love for God too. But look at verse 19. This is the condemnation, the light is coming to the world. And men loved darkness rather than light. Men, yes, I'm sad to say that it's the very same word, agapeo. They valued darkness. And because they valued darkness and cherished darkness, they put that above everything else. Listen to me now. Same definition, same word, but in different circumstances. They put themselves under the darkness to worship the darkness because they found value in sin and in darkness, rather than the light of God. That's the condemnation. That's scary, isn't it? When we see the light of the world, Genesis 1, chapter 1, I want to read this to you. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void. It means chaos. The darkness was on the face of the deep. The Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. In the very beginning, God said, let there be light. But man chose darkness. They were drawn to it to the point that they saw value in it. Why is it that the people of this world are not repenting and running to God? They see no value in God. But they see value in whatever, the, whatever sin you want to call it. We could list them, but we'd, we'd be here all day and we'd still miss some. Let's just call it sin. But God made this beautiful way. Now, Pastor, you're not talking much about discipleship. Well, let's bring it there. Let's bring it there. When salvation comes, 
And in this, we see this in the, in the life of Nicodemus. Now, John chapter 8, he was there uh, in the Sanhedrin, and he was defending Christ. We see in John 19, when Jesus had been crucified, Joseph of Arimathea came to take the body of Christ and to, to bury it. Nicodemus was there with him because the Bible said he was a believer. He was a disciple of Christ. But when a person knows their sin and turns from that and turns to God and says, says I believe in you. I know that you made it away. You left heaven. You're the son of God that left heaven and, and you came to die that on the cross of Calvary. You took my place. You took my sin. So Lord, forgive me of my sin and, and, and come into my heart and save me. All my life I give to you. That is a one-time event throughout all of eternity, but there are too many Christians today see that that is the completed work. Your salvation is complete at that very moment. I'm going to say that again. Don't get me wrong. Y'all listening? Your salvation is complete when you give your heart and life to Christ. You pray. You ask him to do what only he can do. He saves you. But that's the beginning. That's the beginning. You don't stay there. You grow in the likeness of the light. A child is born. You don't leave it. Praise God, it's born. Just leave it there. You nurture it. They get a little older. They get a little sassy, and you have to, isn't it, isn't it funny that that's when you have to start potty training them? They learn with that little two-letter word, no. And you want to say, well, just sit in it, you know. Potty training wasn't fun. And I don't know about y'all, but in our house, whoever changed the diaper was whoever's closest. We had three kids in diapers at one time. Felt like buying stock. <laughs> we bought them by the case. But you don't, because you love that child, you change it and make it smell pretty again just for them to do it again. Amen? And you pray that they'll grow out of it. And eventually, they will. My son, my firstborn's up in the balcony. I prayed that God would teach him to talk. And he's been doing it ever since. <laughs> That's the truth. Amen. I don't mean that rudely. I did pray it for him, though. And you send them to school and the, uh, you shake their, your head. Will they learn? But they do. And you love them, and you discipline them. You better discipline them. For, for every person who says, I love my child too much to discipline them, that's not love. That's not love. That's leaving them in their dirty diaper. You, you, you show them the right way. You're patient and long-suffering and kind with them. But they grow, and they move forward, and they go through adolescence. And the father knows nothing. Somebody said one time, they said, they'll grow out of that. We'll see. <laughs> no, don't do that. <laughs> Give me hope. Give me hope. No, I'm just kidding. We're working on the next generation now. Evangeline's in the back. Listen, discipleship is growing in the grace of God. I said something last week that it probably offended a few people, and I'm going to say it again because if I didn't hit you last week, I want to give you an opportunity to be offended this week. <laughs> Amen? If you're only looking for enough salvation to get you into heaven, if you're only looking for, for just enough to get you there, you may not even have that much. Because you see, life is not stagnant. It grows. It grows. And the, the fruit of salvation is growth. Growth to where you grow up and someone say, you look like your father. I want to look like my heavenly father. I want to act like my heavenly father. I want to People say, I sound like my father. <laughs> right. 
discipleship needs to be the flowing of the love of God. We must, we must, we must be discipled in the things of God. Look what it says, verse 19. This is the condemnation that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth, but he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they have been done in God. John chapter 8 says this. Jesus then spoke to them again, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Ephesians, Paul says in chapter 5, verse 8, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. If you have your Bible, flip over to James chapter 1. Very familiar passage. James 1, verse 16. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Why did James say that? Because some were deceived. Every good gift, every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. As we look into the light of God every day, it gives us an ability to walk that day in the light. But he says, there's no variation to it or shadow of turning. Look, if I'm looking at God, look at me now. If I'm looking into the blessedness of God, if I'm looking into the Son of God, Jesus Christ, his light is shining upon me. But if I'm not looking at him and I turn, then I am looking at the shadow. And the shadow is a deception of light. We are to wake up every day. We are to set our heart to true north. We are to put our eyes and our heart on the Lord. We are to let everything that we know of this world, word, we need to bow before our holy God, and we say, no, wherever you lead, I will follow. I will follow you. We need to put our eyes upon him and never turn from the light. What Satan wants to do is dangle something in front of you to get you to turn and chase the darkness. The problem, the, the reason that this is so very, very hard is because we used to love the darkness and value and cherish it. It's an old lost love that we romanticize about sometimes. And those temptations to turn from the light come before us and we start thinking about the old love. When I chose Lynn and she said yes to me, and, and she became, now there was plenty of people that I dated before Lynn, but I chose her. And I put a vow before her. And I can honestly say, I haven't looked back on those old bows. Because that, that, that's not where my, 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 I wake up every day and my relationship with her is pure and clean, and I'm going to keep it that way. If, if there's a temptation to move in the darkness, I don't want that. I want to walk in the light. But it's so easy. So we have to check the overflow. Discipleship begins at salvation and it continues for the rest of eternity. If you've ever gotten to the place that you've got enough, you probably don't have very much. 
check what the Spirit's doing in your life. Let the Holy Spirit take an x-ray of your heart. Where are your affections? Where is your time? We're supposed to be redeeming the time because the days are evil. Are we wasting our time? Are we distracted in time? I don't want to be that person that's still acting like I'm in kindergarten when I'm 57 years old. Have y'all ever seen Christians act like they're still in kindergarten, though their salvation was many years ago? I really don't understand the education system where they graduate you from kindergarten. But they do. I mean, they're, they're putting cat and gowns on. To get them out of kindergarten. I think they just said, praise God. You know. All right. And then they'll graduate you out of elementary school. They'll graduate you out of middle school. They'll graduate you out of high school. You know, in college, you just stand up and sit back down. All that money to sit down, sit back down. All right. Praise God. In the school of Christ, there should be a progression. Yes, there's a knowledge that comes with that. But knowledge alone is not enough. Verse 18, James 1, 18. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. If y'all ever want a good morning dedicate, uh, devotion, that's a good one, verse 19. Verse 20, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness, all that darkness, and the overflow of wickedness. I said we're supposed to have the overflow of his life. He says, lay aside this overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word, not hearers only. Once again, it says, deceiving yourself. If you're not seeking to practice the Word of God, you're deceiving, you're deceiving yourself. Don't be just a hearer. Make sure that every day you take up the, the privilege of the overflow of Christ and walk in the light. Be a doer of the Word. For if anyone is a hearer of the Word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror, for he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. I will tell you, that person is a disciple. That person is growing, growing the grace of God. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but church, listen to me. When God called the disciples, called 12, you think they had a good preacher? You think Jesus was a good preacher? You think he was a good teacher? Do you think he modeled it in front of them? Do you think that they saw the power of God in him? Every day. You can't get a better leader. You can't get a better servant leader. You, you can't get... a. What a wonderful thing it would be to walk with Christ and see him look at people in the world and always put them above himself. Every knee should bow, and one day will. Every tongue should have been confessing. One day they will, but they didn't then. And the, the reason we have the Gospels was you see a progression from mistake after mistake after mistake. I mean, dunderheaded mistake just absolutely ignorant mistake after the next. I talked about this one Wednesday night. He fed the 5,000 as well as women and children, maybe 20,000 people, right? He goes out months later. I mean, he fed the 5,000 on the southeast or southwest corner of the Sea of Galilee. 
Months later, he's up on the northeast kind. There's all the people coming around. He says almost the same words. He's like, he had compassion on the multitudes because they had been with him for days and they didn't have anything to eat. So he looks at his disciples and said, y'all give them something to eat. And they came back and said, where in the world are we going to find bread enough to feed all these people? Matter of fact, that was the same reaction. And then Jesus said, how many loaves do you have? And they went, I mean, they had one of those V8 moments. Y'all know what I mean when I say that? Some of the young whippersnappers in here might not know what I'm talking about. Ask your parents or your grandparents. They didn't get it. They didn't get it. I mean, even before he was crucified, they left him. Was he mad? No, it was a progression of growth. He allowed them to fail. Matter of fact, Paul went on to say, when I am weak, then I am strong. Y'all get tired of failing? But that's how we grow. That's how we learn. And we're mentored. And we're discipled. The light. Or the darkness. Agape. Value and cherish. The word phileo means to get receive joy from. So you can meet someone and y'all get along famously and they become a great friend and you have brotherly love toward them because they bring joy to your life. But you may move away and, or you may get in a spat with them. And, and you, get in, you no longer get joy from them. You walk away from it. This is what scares me. Is the reality is that some Christians who are supposed to agape God, phileo God, there was something that went on in their life and they came to Jesus and they got great joy from it. But later on, they kind of didn't get the same joy out of it anymore. Same thrill. They kind of had that love for the old darkness again. And they chased after the dark. We don't ever see them anymore in church. Because they never really fully yielded it all into the Lord. They stop growing in discipleship. We got church members the FBI couldn't find. Y'all know that. I'm not sure heaven will find some of them. That makes me sad. I really don't want anyone to go to hell from the, the row at New Holland Baptist Church. I really don't. It'll be about his business. New Holland, you've said this is a core value. Go ye therefore and make disciples. God called us to this. A great commission. We need to be about his business. Father God, we love you, we praise you, we thank you. Thank you for the opportunity of coming to this place in the middle of the afternoon. Thank you for letting us be able to look at the great chapter, John 3. But Lord, I pray that we will make a commitment not just to see Jesus, the only begotten Son of God on the cross of Calvary. But Lord, we, could see, we would look to see him actively walking in our every day with us. Emmanuel. In our hardships, in our pains, in our brokenness, in our successes, in, in the things that thrill our soul. Father, help us to grow up in Christ. Father, I truly mean this. May we be about your business. The family business. Lord, what a privilege it is to know you. Lord, use us today. I pray that by the power of the Spirit of God that we will look in our life and I pray that we will never cherish the things of darkness. 
May we never only have a fondness of you. But Lord, remind us that we find our value in you and in you alone. The things of this world, they need to grow strangely dim. Father, maybe we need to renew our commitment today to you. Lord, Holy Spirit, yield the invitation, give the invitation as only you can. But Lord, may your will be done. Sir, may we honor you. May our life, every moment, be for your praise and your glory. May we never turn to the variation or shadow of turning. May we always keep our face towards you. Father, I know that we've got to walk it out, but Lord, we need to make a commitment even to that right now. We can't wait. We need to make it now. So do it in our hearts, Lord. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.